Uh, welcome back to your number one breakfast show, and I hope that you're having as much information and engagement as possible. We're online, so you can always talk with us, Silverbed News 24. So she wanted to have a big discussion we're going to have yeah, this morning around absolutely. leadership uh, question. And almost everyone, even during the paper review headline, even during the news update, uh, there's a, a lot of questions around the sort of leadership that will emerge and the sort of questions that people think should be asked uh, because they are the ones who should have the answers. Almost every single thing that has problems in this country is always back to the leadership question on how much they really know. Yeah. Unfortunately, many times we don't have. And sometimes there's always a rush to want to make things happen or correct things without getting people involved because I think that the, the, the sort of, maybe it's the patriarchal society we live in, in, yeah. leadership, in leadership being thought as being making that decision, only yeah. the person. We don't get representative involvement in the decision making to say, okay, everybody come in, this is what you have to do, this is what you have to do, then the leader is the one who coordinates and then says, based on all I have gathered from everyone, this is the end result. And I saw that particular, thing, particular play out during this, um, the railway corporation. No one took responsibility for all that's happened. Maybe they're afraid they're going to be fired. But lives have been lost. Yeah. What could be worse than a life being lost? And anyone take responsibility that, look, I goofed. I didn't do my own part well. Mm -hmm. Going forward, how do we make sure this doesn't reoccur? None of those questions have been asked. I saw the paper, paper this morning. They said they had done about seven coaches out of the 11. Uh, they've prepared about 80. The big question is the breaches that happened. How did they get in an embarrassed situation, for example, where we don't even know how many people were on the train? Or the you know, railway guy who was here the other day and said that we don't have the list of the railway workers on the train. You were, you you were saying it earlier on that leadership. by now that there must uh, the operations you know, around uh, mm. within the corporation should be looked at. And I mentioned it last week that nobody is talking about who's running this organization. Yeah. Uh, we're talking about, yeah, there was an attack and the minister had come out to say, well, the trains as we speak, I want to believe, except something has changed since the last attack on the, on, on the train happened, that uh, the security uh, equipment that should be used to allow the trains to see danger ahead, that the monies for such were not approved yeah. uh, from the top, so to speak. And maybe that was the reason, or that's been the reason why uh, the man in charge of uh, the, the, the NRC sees as if he should be absolved of everything that's going on. It goes beyond that. It goes beyond that. I've been on the train a couple of times, only uh, Lagos, uh, Ibadan route, and I thoroughly enjoyed myself. Uh, a lot of operations, uh, lab stays there, and which I relate on this program, um, which I would have expected by now, should have been fixed, but they still subsist. And so the big question is, is it that we cannot run something it, one single thing, perfectly, successfully, world standard in the country. And that's the big question. Just to run a transport organization, say, ah, it's not just okay. If I wouldn't see my job as something I'll, I'll refer to as just because I would have mastered it and learned on how to be better on it, then why, why am I on the job? So uh, as of today, I want to imagine that even getting ticket, ticketing is still a challenge uh, when it comes to uh, you know uh, the transportation, the rail transport in the country. Ticketing is still a challenge. A lot of other things still beg to be answered. For instance, even security, you just take your luggage and everything. Who checks whether you're carrying bomb or not? Yeah, that's the honest truth. I've been on it a couple of times, yeah. and nobody actually saw what was going on right. in my in my luggage. So it's just an example of the leadership issue that we have in the country. Uh, if you want to start to cite instances, they're just countless that you, perhaps you also have experienced this morning. So uh, we want to see how we can bring leadership to the, its best level ever in 2023. And it can only start from now because we are not going to go into 2023 with the fire brigade approach. We have learned a lot. We've been through a lot and we are going through a lot. Absolutely. And it's, it's, it's what happens across board. Uh, you know, this is just the real... Um, it's, the, it's the question people were asking about the, which I, interesting, I was at the Pastor Adibui's um, service yesterday. Yeah. Who's stealing the oil? Who's selling, who's buying the oil, stolen oil? You know, those are questions we need answers to from the leadership. So the leadership question today is going to be addressed this morning. Uh, Victor, Victor Kuchili. Victor Kuchili. Victor Kuchili is an author as well as a development uh, consultant. Thank you very much, Victor Kuchili, for joining us this morning. Uh, it's a pleasure speaking with you. If, if you can, if you will unmute your device, Victor, I, I, 
I think um, it's on mute, so we can. Yeah, maybe we just have to let him fix that uh, in just a moment, then we'll get back to him. All right, Victor, we'll get back to you in just a moment. I'm yeah. sure that you will, you know, yes, all yeah. these devices and all of that. Yeah. Uh, Victor is uh, always uh, very interesting. I, I listen to his interviews. I can't wait Good. to hear his view on uh, the leadership question that we have in the country. We also have to let you know that you can be part of this conversation. All you have to do is to go on our social media handles and bear your mind, just very few, as concise as possible, bear your mind on the leadership, uh, you know, question that that hangs on the Nigerian state and let's hear your views not just about the complaints but the solution uh, we all seem to know the problem we all are looking for a solution that uh, we should be the way forward uh, I, I, I was talking about that where the big focus this month will be on voter education ahead 2023 election mm. uh, we talked about this a couple of times and we still talk about it today on the fact that uh, many Nigerians don't care about elections they believe that uh, the, the, the upper class or the, politi the politicians have it in their pocket mm -hmm. and that even their votes would never count because some would even tell you that they've written the, the figures out before the elections hold. And so why should they bother themselves to go under the rain or sun uh, to go uh, cast their you know, votes? So there's, there, must, there, there, there is a need to change that, uh, you know, that narrative because we have to take this country, you know, and, and take it to the next level by ourselves. And the number of uncollected PVCs with INEC is alarming. And so if, all, if you took out the pains to go register to vote and your voter card is ready and you don't care to collect it in spite of all that's going on, and you are the one, you are one of the willing wheelers, as Fem Hedishma will call you, one of the willing wheelers who will say things are not happening, but you've never voted. And you don't even plan to vote. So you have to cope with whichever government, uh, you know, the people who decide to vote or those who you've always accused to, to manipulate the electoral process give to you. So you have no, you have no, you have, you have, you have no right, no. the moral right to go ahead and complain. So uh, I think that's where it is. We, we have Victor back with this yes. now. We got, we got Victor Kuchili back, author and development consultant. Uh, Victor, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Good morning morning and i'm sure it's a it's a brilliant morning where you are um we're going to move the plaque towards you the box yes, just the, is good uh -huh. <laughs> just so is cool the book the book will stop at your desk this morning because you will answer the leadership question of all the problems we're going to haul at you and we hope you have the right responses for <laughs> them <laughs> so first and foremost um, i want to i want to imagine that you um, already think about in the nigerian context what I know it's a very vague and broad question, but I, I, I do hope that you can help us understand what is a summary of the Nigerian leadership problem. Or do, we, or do, we, do you think we don't have a leadership problem? Well, uh, with the gamut of problems we have in the country, you will naturally, you obviously see that there's a lot of leadership gap um, created by the decisions that we have been able to you know trigger over the years i think the first uh, challenge that i see is that we often forget so quickly that after the politicking and ele electioneering processes the next thing is called governance and we still take the consciousness and the the, the mindset of all the politicking and the campaigns and we take them right into the governance uh, cycle and that will naturally naturally get us out of the way so th there is there, there are people in position of leadership, but whether leadership has been delivered is totally a different uh, ball game. Right now, if you look at all the indicators, we're not doing good. Yet there are leaders. We are not doing good on education. We're not doing good on our economy. We're not doing good employment. We are unfortunately increasing our unemployment status. We're increasing our poverty cycle. We're increasing levels of unproductivity in spite of so much that has been given out in terms of interventions either from the central bank or from other sources that would attempt to try to work within our, our communities and our, the country. So truly there is a huge gap when it comes to leadership is around here. All right, Victor, uh, when we say there is a huge gap between leadership and perhaps the followership, 
the big question is who are the leaders in the first instance? You would agree with me that they're drawn from the uh, you know, uh, followers who now have become leaders yeah. in the country. So all our leaders are drawn from pools of families, you and I, those that are there. And so if you want to, with the understanding of the peculiarity of the Nigerian politics and how leadership, how far leadership has taken us or has not taken us, what would you say are the fundamental issues uh, that uh, are keeping us where we are at this moment? Well, first of all, the idea that uh, it's, it's been a constant idea that the, the, follow, the, the leadership comes from the followership, uh, that in itself only stands when you also argue that whether the followership were actually allowed to choose the leadership that they do have right now. This, these are questions for us. We had a former president in this country who admitted that the system that brought him was not really uh, the right, uh, it was all faulted and uh, lots of flaws in there. And he felt that it was necessary to really rethink about that process. So while it is true, yes, in um, distant societies, um, um, for lack of word, in societies that are concerned about what comes out of leadership, we will stand on that same premise that, okay, the followership actually release the kind of leadership that they experience. But again, let's uh, we can't keep crying about that. We are here already. So what is the issue? What was the challenge? I, I think for me, the first thing is that most Nigerian leaders are not interested in making sacrifices for for the country. It's usually a, a place where people are interested in what comfort they can have rather than what sacrifices they can take in. And unfortunately for the followership themselves, they have not asked the hard questions. They've not really gone out to ask the leadership what truly they, 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 they are interested in making sure that they can measure the leadership worth. This, this is coming from uh, an experience I had with the ICPC working with a couple of organizations and they, and, you know, ethnic groups also. And what ICPC was attempting to do was to show the whole world that your members who are in the National Assembly, these are their uh, contributions, these are monies coming to them in constituency allowances, and you will be shocked to find out that even dialysis machines were, were, were actually left somewhere. And, and people got angry. It, grass is all growing there. Um, you call them the kekena pep or the tuk tuk, depending on where you are. All that being put together, the grass is all growing. And people got angry. But I asked the question at that meeting, what actually did we ask these leaders to go and do that we're angry about them right now? Why didn't we have a social contract clearly stating this is exactly what we wanted them to do and they are not doing it and so we're getting angry about it. So the followership in itself has not really helped the leadership in making sure that there is a sense of direction. People come in and they tell us all sorts of what they think they can do and sometimes we even say they have a manifesto but you and I know that if you take the manifestos of the uh, big parties in Nigeria. You can only change words. They're just nomenclature, changing one word for the other. And at the end of it, we're losing out in on everything. So I think, first of all, the followership in itself, um, for lack of using the right word, is also lazy in terms of identifying what the real challenges are, what the real problems are. Recently, I've heard people talking about, no, don't vote a party, vote a candidate. Again, it's sounding like it's the right direction, but I'm asking, is it about the candidature or is it about the quality of what we need the candidature to be able to express, to reflect when the candidate eventually becomes um, the, the, the uh, becomes uh, goes into government? This, this is that we need to be and unfortunately the followership is not taking that responsibility i have asked community you say that there is no water in your community is it coming from the people from the community a decision that you think the next community had water and so we should have the uniqueness of every community is into the decisions that we must take if we will have our leaders running so again responsibility that we not taking time to really work on what we expect them to do. Unfortunately, the system also has not allowed us to vote sometimes the right people that we want to. So that at the end for me is the level of sacrifice that both the followership and the leadership is not ready to 
The leadership is not ready to go in down and check and really come up with the issues for them, asking the right questions. And so you're not going to get the right answers. And of course, the leadership is taking advantage of them. And they are busy doing what they want to do. And we all get trapped at the end of the day and destroy ourselves. All, all right, Victor, we're going to go on a quick break. And we come back, we'll continue the discussion and, um, on voter education and uh, tie the knot okay. towards uh, the leadership question. Please stay with us on News Hub. You can now stream Silverbird News 24 live on mobile app. All you need to do is to download Silverbird News 24 app from Google Play Store on your Android devices and App Store or on your Apple devices. Tap the live button at the bottom bar to watch us live 24-7. You can enjoy all our news programs including PJ News and program. Silverbird News 24. The news never stops. Welcome back and significant question we're asking, the leadership question, and what role does the electorate play in decision-making process? And Victor Cuccilli, who is an author and development consultant, has been helping us navigate this murky waters, giving us an example about how difficult it could be sometimes even when you have the ICPC step in and you cannot even have the people hold the leaders who have been found to have compromised your roles and responsibilities and sometimes you'll find out that they are attacked. Victor Kuchile, are you still there? Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm right here with you. Excellent. So, big question here. So, we, we now know that leadership in this yeah. country oftentimes is a one-way street. The people aren't getting involved in it and makes you wonder oftentimes whether those decisions they are making uh, takes the interest of the people when we know that since the 70s and 80s, the shift in paradigm for decision making has been planning with the people rather than planning for the people. How do you get people to take ownership of the system, of the product, of an election when they don't even have a say in how any of these things have emerged? Well, first, I think it's even a deliberate plan by the, I often say the parties are not taking their responsibilities very seriously because I've asked this question, I mean, uh, who needs the votes? The INEC goes out to count the votes. What is available, they count and give us the results. Whether you accept it or not, that's a whole different ball game. Then the second thing is the fact that 
interested in getting their votes counted, do they really go out and do that? But most importantly, those who will need to get into office, the political parties themselves. I think the internal structures of political parties are not being designed in such a way to go into proper mobilization. I've asked, I've, I've tried to take um, a closer look at the strategies of the political parties and I'm asked at what point do they mobilize their people? At what point do they give a strong budget to go out and strategically get the people to get involved in the political process? It's usually a process of um, when the next uh, cycle of elections comes in, people Tested, so let's go out. Or if there seem to be some division within the political parties, what do they do? They just have a committee. Then they go around and try to see whether they can get their members back. But I think it should be from day one a deliberate the people into that system. Unfortunately, I must say, one of the trends that's are beginning to become very clear to us is that there is what we call the new power around the new where it's it's not even the institutions are failing and so the power of people becoming uh, more relevant is actually on the streets and that is my fear because when the power is on the street sometimes you can't really coordinate it properly so we must start first of all with the political party structure do they have a system of attempting to mobilize their people how much do they budget for mobilization of the people how much they pay for gubernatorial presidential candidates, how how much of that is given to go out and mobilize the people, educate the people, let them know the power of this. Uh, most of the times we deliberately leave it out because we really want to shortchange the people. And the more they don't even come up, they do not have a right to complain. The second level is the people themselves. We very interesting in this country that people want change and they don't want their lives to be altered. They want change, they don't want the situation about them, the commitment that comes from them to be triggered. They want change and then they want a better life, but they are not interested in how this becomes a necessary process. Government and governance, it's, none of us. it's very important that we understand that the decision taken by every single person who goes into power will naturally affect you. Today, the, the um, universities are, are all shut down and I can guarantee coming from decisions taken, by people who we elected into office. And we are doing literally nothing about it. So we must ask ourselves, do we have an understanding of what governance is? Do we understand that the decisions by either not going to vote or not going to be interested in the process itself will eventually redefine the quality of life you have? This the people in government is releasing the kind of statistics we have. So it's important that that clearly taken into, but we also have an app that is interested. Now this night, the, the country that is quite a religious country. I don't know how we're mobilizing the churches in our mocks to truly go out and, and vote. Sometimes on the pulpit and sometimes with the, uh, and the pastors talk about does not even encourage the people to go there. We complain a lot, but we are not committed to anything. And no country, no country gets its um, structure and development secured without commitment. Look at what is happening in Ukraine, that some people will use their hands to attempt to block an uh, uh, attack simply because they're committed to means to have a country. So it's important for, for, for us to take the responsibility and educate ourselves, first of all, because naturally, naturally, they affect us at the end of the day. All right, Victor, let, let me start with these three questions that I've dubbed the two Ws and the H. Uh, how do we start to educate, for instance, the electorate on who they should vote for? Okay, it's, it's, um, you see, I am interested in even the process that gets you to become a governor or a member of House of Assembly or the Senate. Um, one clear direction to start is to look at the antecedents of people. This is the country that people come in from anywhere and nowhere and just become, they are exposed to our tradition. 
and we begin to wonder what what are they doing with that because you cannot become a president of a country without some story behind you the united states is not truly bothered about who becomes president they're bothered about the process that gets you there it's so hot it can burn down the house of wax in a short time because and all it's asking is where were you coming from how did you behave where you were listen we have agencies and organizations departments in this country that are not performing budgetary allocations have been given to them delivered to them every chief executive leaves that place and becomes a multi-millionaire but the agencies are not working yet these people come back with the stolen funds and tell we must come look for them because they now think they have a new idea on how to run this country. So the first thing we need to do is, do we search, do we take our personal research about our leaders important? We are not really bothered coming. So because poverty has been triggered and, and there's a lot of hunger, and of course hunger and poverty are us. So what happens is that we simply think we can claim this and then we destroy ourselves at the end of the day. Act. Where are they coming from? How did they behave? What results did they create? Because this is a result of year. The leadership of a country at any level is about, you're not going to be measured by your intentions, you measured by the results you generate. And most importantly, it's not even become what, what you do, it's what eventually become to the people. Because it's transient. We, you will leave that place, you live with a lot of experience. We need to tap from those experiences. But imagine you came as a thief stole funds, disappear, and then we are spending money in courts to try to get what we can't even get all back. Because again, it's not allowing us to get everything that we need to get back. So the first thing we need to do is let our people invest in finding out, asking their hard questions. The second thing, our um, community leaders must Ask them. So I've had issues with people who talk about mobilizing. There's no separation between people who are attempting to mobilize and people who jump into the, the, the ring and, and be part of it. It's, it's a, there's a huge problem in that direction because who attempt to even say, okay, let's let's mobilize these people. You eventually discover that they're mobilizing it these people for themselves. And at the end, we don't have people who are sacrificing anything at all. They are not in anything, they are only interested in their well-being. And so people who truly want to get involved in the teaching system must ask, we must as leaders, I mean, as community people, what are they really in? Are they mobilizing us for the good of the community? Can they stand? We've asked this question over time that if the privilege and the uh, privileges that come with officers in Nigeria are actually taken out for those officers. I've heard people tell me they're self-sufficient and then they become thieves when they become governors. We must ask ourselves whether we are interested in a system that delivers um, security, that delivers education, that it's interested in the next generation, or we're just interested in a system, what we can get now and destroy ourselves. And for me, truly, let's find out where are they are coming from? What have they done? What are their antecedents? And this will determine what they do when they become um, leaders. Plenty to think about, uh, Victor. You, you, you know, the government starts yeah. at the local level oftentimes, and um, people have said it, it, would be, it would have been a lot easier if the local governments were functional and then you had uh, the people as civil society begin to ask questions at the local level. It doesn't exist across states. So, in the absence of local government structure for people to work their way up, uh, what, what other options do you have in forming groups? Uh, with, 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 uh, with large populations? I think, again, it goes back to people who are uh, is interested in budget, budget tracking. And I can tell you, uh, I'm sad to say that people who call themselves leaders in this country say they are elders in this country are not truly truly interested in taking their necks where it really matters and that's where the problem for most of us starts i've been to a meeting where the and i shared it a couple of days back the professor delivered a wonderful speech about how to govern this country the 
vocation happens to also be a professor. And so we said, okay, let's have a movement. And the chairman said, uh, since you first who delivered the speech, why don't you uh, lead the process? And then I'll, I'll follow. And, and the professor would say, no, chairman, man, I mean, you're, you're chairing the uh, uh, system, right? You're chairing this, why don't you start? Many people are not interested. They don't believe in this country. So we challenge one. Number two, um, mobilization must start. People who must be interested, first of all, in community development, not personal development. You must have like people who are interested in strategically investing in finding out what the real issues are. Many people start talking about the developmental issues when it's, it's very close to election and you never get to know until you're rubbed in and then discover that you are actually working for some other person. This is what I think we can just, um, the, the civil society groups must be interested in finding out truly, truly what these people in the communities are interested in. This is not just about saying that we know they don't have light, we know that there's no education, it's important that you have that. And so we rally around a particular um, area of interest. The problem with our groups, they are just too open and they, they, they fight in every direction. And at the end of it, we lose, we spread ourselves. So we must, first of all, identify one area that we will be interested in to say, want to get done. I want to see gender issues and, and the group truly, truly interested in gender issues. Not that we go to a meeting with people in power and the first thing they say gender uh, interested in what inclusions and, and uh, that can be done and before you know it they talk about something else so until we have a rallying point around what is of importance you we probably cannot go into any other um, uh, successful journey then we must start with the I, I think the secondary schools as well we must start forming groups and i'm saying this from experience That's what we with some of our um, the groups, we, we've gone to secondary schools to start educating people and allowing them to form groups to make demands on themselves, first of all, and then translate it to the school. So it's a strategy that we can start working on. Uh, I've heard of the much older people, 70s and 60s, I mean 90s, I mean 70s and 80s, who say that their generation is all lost. I, I think I want to save my generation. So I mean, I'm going back to those secondary schools and mobilizing people from that move into probably that can start the journey that we all need and then the um ethnic groups that we have it's so sad that we are only fighting ourselves not fighting for, for the ourselves i have shared this in a, in a different forum where the ethnic groups can have a simple album i usually say say it in pictures let these people see it is. I shared this in, in, in a meeting and somebody said, no, that's not his community. But his district head was there and told him that's his community, uh, the, the community is looking like because children are still sitting down. On, uh, I mean, you know, we, we call them mud, mud blocks. They are all see them after school and you think they have been playing with dust all day long, but they went to school. So immobilization must start with very specific that we want to see it done. If we achieve that, but once we are too fleet, once we are too open to any, we probably get nothing at the end of the day. I mean, that's a very profound submission there, Victor. And I mean, everyone would say that's the right way to go. But you and I know that when elections, let me say, well, let me say when elections come, let me pray, I hope and pray that things will change from 2023. In the past elections, you and I knew then that uh, most voters were from the you know, grassroots. Uh, highly would you find people in the urban areas or those people like you and I going out to vote on election day. We, we are the ones that make the loudest noise on social media and other platforms. When it comes to the voting days, we hardly are found on the queues. So, uh, which goes about the, my second W. You've addressed it a little bit earlier, on, but let's delve into it much deeper this time around. So why even the elites and the people, middle class, the people like you and I, should vote in the coming election. And not leave it to the mammalogers, the market women, and market uh, you know, and men, and what have you, and for, for, to, to go and decide who leads us. 
well, for for to, to take on from that, I vote. Actually, I vote. I do all I can, but that's personal. <laughs> the light of the... When I'm out of duty, I do. Um, <laughs> yes, I, I do understand where you're coming from. I think our, our educated, enlightened people would get to misguide um, ourselves because, again, I have a very serious concern, just as you where people say they're educated, where people say they understand what is going on. It also comes from the fact that they don't even in the, uh, in their friends who are running for offices because some of them are the most educated you can imagine, but they, they don't believe in that. And then they, they complain a lot about uh, the results that are being generated and all sorts of things without their total sense of commitment. I think um, engagements must and one, one, one such area that we can start thinking about is our, our debate structure. The, the elites, uh, elites get excited about uh, a structured system. They want to sit in a structured system. That can trigger some level of wanting to eventually get into election. Appeal to them from their intellect. You appeal to them from what they know. And our society. I think uh, maybe in this dispensation that we began having good debates. In some states, I have suggested that you should have at least more than two debates. That can trigger the minds of people who believe they're educated to start asking, maybe that's the right way to go. Most of the times, they come with a conclusion that people will not do much. But I think when we start listening to the people who are in, in that can help us to trigger some kind of election. The second aspect still comes to our, our, politi our political parties. They have not invested enough in the education. You, you come to communities, I, I want to see a district literally with the leaders. Most educated people who want to express themselves and feel that they know what they're talking about they, and they can contribute and they can make assessment of whatever is happening. Get that platform for them to also uh, release whatever ideas they have and then hold them responsible tomorrow by whether they come out to vote or not. So again, we, we are not uh, stimulating the minds of these people. You know the reason why the, the people in the villages are stimulated to go back? Because it's actually a trigger a system from hunger and poverty because you, you just make people feel guilty by saying that you're giving them rappers, you're giving them money and literally because they are organized within those levels they are so scared to say that if I collect it and I don't go and then of course because they are religious people too if I don't go that's going to be a problem or my conscience will will affect me I mean will, will you know be on me and I will not be quite happy about it so I need to do that but I think the strategy is different when it comes to the town these are people who have made their monies. These are people who feel they're educated. One way to do trigger sessions, I call them dialogue cycles, that we can actually discuss those issues. And it is a deliberate thing to hear them talk about it and hold them responsible tomorrow. By the time they do not come, for instance, there are people within my community that in the last elections, I did not see them come up. And I have not stopped reminding them that they don't have a right to ask any questions because they have literally, in fact, triggered, because some of them had adults in their homes and just told them, this is this is a charade, and people are not going to come out and do anything. So the approach to the local, I mean, people in the villages will be different because the poverty level in, the, in those villages are quite high. And, and what these politicians do is go with uh, some kind of money, some food, some kind of anything that triggers their interest and the people come out. Haven't you seen that at some point they line up, literally line up and you collect the money before you go and vote? But when it comes, you, you can't do that in towns because it's believed that they're educated people, they're enlightened people. But what then do you have for them to engage, to really identify allowed and are not voting? How do we shame them also? Because let them also know that it's a collective question. I have been asked on TV and radio that sometimes we do this analysis and we are the greatest flop into government. And I said it's, it's a valid question, it's a valid expression because people without we without going back to check their antecedents people talk and then we take the faith without asking them the, the, the very um, hard questions so for me the strategy for those who are in the uh, get them into dialogue cycles let them express let them vent out let them talk about the things they have in their heads two things happen number one we know who 
uh, who they are. We know what they're talking about. No, we will also focus on them to see whether they will come out and vote or not. Absolutely. And something you say about getting people to be um, how they can hold their leaders responsible. So I see two situations here. One, people who vote and then those who don't turn out to vote. And then those who voted a government in uh, then accused of having voted the wrong government and shouldn't uh, complain when things go bad. And then those who did not vote, they're told that because you did not vote, you don't have any rights to criticize or expect anything for, for them. Uh, give or take, maybe they repent and say, well, we belong to this community and we, we, we have a stake in what happens. How, how do you think this should be approached in terms of how people after have elected those in government and decide to uh, mess up the system can still hold them to account? Well, well, it's 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 um, quite unfortunate that it's in this country that uh, because you are voted in, naturally I should support everything you do. It's, it's a wrong idea because you, uh, in all the most sophisticated, all the best uh, ways to solve problems. I mean, problem solving skills tells you there's no one way out, and you are human too. Um, accepting where you had gone wrong. It's, it's heal it. But when you insist that what you're doing is right and the results we are getting uh, to, then that, if you can own up to that, it shows some weakness and maturity and leadership that we, we, we carry. Um, they, they must speak out. In fact, those who voted and uh, Greatly voted a particular um, party or person should even be the loudest in making sure that is, is, is taken correctly because uh, unfortunately we don't do that because we don't think we are also responsible for whatever results they are generating. After all, we were not uh, voting them because we believe they were going to perform. We're voting them possibly because of the privileges that we're going to get. I've also seen where people are not even being honest in criticizing people power. Get a little bit closer to them, and you soon discover that uh, he had been promised a position and he didn't get that, so he becomes quite loud and starts mobilizing people. I've been in a group where quite elders, uh, elderly people who got into a bitter fight and also discover that somebody was appointed a special advisor and was not given a vehicle, and he felt that was not right. And so, that, so again, that in itself does not, uh, we, we need to be able to check those people who are making that kind of assertion. Then those of us who um, have voted possibly on the other side and our candidates didn't get. It is a normal thing to do. In fact, we need to possibly be taught on how to get into the opposition camp, what opposition really do. Uh, I share this in the UK where you find that uh, whether you're the Conservative or the Labour Party, whoever wins, the other party simply line people who um, are in line with the uh, people in power. For instance, we have a secretary of, of education, you have a secretary of education on the other opposition who checks everything. And the essence of that is that you can raise valid questions based on facts. Unfortunately, we don't do that. We we go on hearsays and, and government because we don't do our research very well. Again, we don't get anything done properly. So those who have voted, please, it is our, your responsibility to go out and truly find details truly find details, make demands that it's a public system, is our public money. So find details, don't just make assumptions because you don't like the person. I have seen a project where we were told that it's going to take about 18 billion, only for uh, a little research to discover that it's, it's 9 billion. And by the time you say this, th there's something that goes wrong with our psyche. What is wrong here? What makes it right on the other side? And you cast this kind of doubt on whatever your credibility comes with. And at the end, you lose out. So the essence Position. The essence of the fact that I've lost an election is to make sure that the person who gets in there does the right thing for one reason, because it's going to affect me at the end of the day. So I must take time and do my own research and find out what is the true position so that I can come up with that. And those who do not even vote and claim that they have um, come from us, they claim that uh, they understand it much better. And it is a sign of weakness your intellectual ability to say that it's, that you know it better and that's why you did not go out to vote. If you do know, you go out to correct it. The essence of that is because it's going to affect you, whether you like it or not. So if you truly think you know, if you truly want to show us that you're educated, you're enlightened, you have traveled, go out and vote and change whatever it is. And then you yeah. can discuss. But it's a sign of weakness for me to say 
you didn't vote because you, you think it's all going to go bad. All right, Victor. Uh, there had been instances where people very close to me did not go out to vote because they didn't like uh, the candidates or they were being fielded by the political parties. They didn't trust them. They felt that they wouldn't deliver on the promises they made or uh, that they would not deliver on the things the Nigerians needed at that point in time. So this has always formed the uh, crux of discussion where Nigerians will be like, why should I go and vote? I don't want this person. This person's antecedents do not speak enough for me to say he should lead us or should be in this capacity. So why? I don't need to do it. My conscience won't allow me to vote because I'm not in agreement uh, when it comes to the candidates that have been fielded. How do you start to talk to people like that? Because some would say that it's justified. First of all, we, we are not voting either way. We're not voting angels. And, and whoever is also, if you look at your life, cl clearly you, there are areas that, you, of course, you need um, uh, kind of, uh, support that needs to be brought in, in there. Um, but the essence of voting is to be able to get the, the, the needed support, the needed magnitude, the needed f to remind the person that we can also vote you out. It's not just voting because we need you in there, but also this number shows our commitment, and that number can actually come out and vote you out. And it's, I mean, the history of this country, you can actually correct some of the uh, undoings and, and, and the in our polls, when uh, polling units rather, when people don't go out to vote, and eventually our voting system gets us um, better. Now, coming to say that um, the do not form any, uh, they are not the right people, but at least they are the ones who offered. If, if you think you, you could offer, that's better. But this other, because we can leave that place in a vacuum with some to occupy it. And so the question is the elections, when the results are going to be delivered, uh, given out, th there are specific words they use. They, they tell you it's a fair, fair election. They are not talking about the election being 100% sure. All the people that we face to date, when we say some leaders do not perform, we're not saying that um, they have not done anything. We say, when we say they've not performed, is that there's an expectation they have not been able to. And so continuity, governance is a continuum. So we, we simply continue from where they start. But I think it's, uh, it's, it's wrong to just say that among all, of all we don't have, there's what we call at least better. In English, there's best, the better. I mean, there's better and best. So we, we might have to eventually work with what we have, but keep moving. Let me ask this question. How many of us will be comfortable with Democracy. With today, we the poverty level, and I, I'm talking about the numbers. The poverty level puts us at about 86 million people who are poor in this country. We are poverty capital of the we are the second or third in, uh, terrorized country in the world. We are uh, the second largest producer of uh, tomatoes. We are the uh, first imp largest importers of tomato paste, and all this. All indicators that do not give us the right direction. But are we saying that we are, we are comfortable to say the military should go back? No. We will still process the system. We will still be interested in it. We will still be refining it. We, we should come up and make those demands. We should come out and vote the people who are at least make little sense. First of all, let's start from there. Today, we electronic process and nobody gave us a, an opportunity to go through electronic voting. Today we are here talking about electronic voting. The women who were told that you, you, once you marry outside of this country, you cannot uh, be taken seriously again politically in this country, they have put in their place. This is the opportunity. So saying that we're going to be voting an angel, we're saying that who is even a better candidate? Who sounds or knows has done some has got some history that looks like it's progressive, and then we can work on that. The, by the time you do that, you keep um, narrowing the, the the space for the right people to keep. We're making it hotter by the day. We're beginning to talk much more. Imagine uh, during the military era, how many of us were interested in talking about or questioning any military leader? So we've got that opportunity and we shouldn't let it go. We shouldn't destroy it. We shouldn't um, not be part of it. And at the end of the day, take us. Yes, I believe that if you go out to vote, uh, vote a better person among them, 
again, they're not angels, we can now start talking about the process. But if to say that we will jettison the whole process, it's, it's a sign of weakness. Hmm. I, I, I remember Victor reading Charles Dickens' Great Expectations uh, as a child, and we, we all wanted the, the orphan okay. to succeed, you know. It's the same kind of thinking, I think, most times for leadership in this country. Uh, you talk about the 86 million poor people. There's a, a hundred million people living in multidimensional poverty, and as a development consultant, I'm sure you understand poverty. Certainly, multidimensional yeah. levels of poverty. How? How? What was the threshold in terms of expectations that you think people should have for those in governance? Because this is going to be a very long journey uh, towards freedom. If you're going to crunch those numbers, it will take decades, if not even a hundred years, uh, to see any significant change happen in this country. You, you don't get sustainable results by inconsistency. There are things, I, I, again, is a problem of governance and leadership here. There are times, and we have seen people in government who have created systems that are working. And because there's a change of guard in terms of party lines, it's a sense that completely and create something almost like the other with a different name and a, and every document on all the gains. It, we, we are not leveraging on our uh, residual knowledge. We are not at all in this country. We, we get so trapped by the fact that it's my turn and so it's about me and I need to look good. And so we create inconsistencies at the end of the day. I can tell you about engage in projects similar to existing projects in their own communities. The meaning here is that the monies that should have been used, maybe half of that, to complete what is in existence, abundant, uh, that has been abandoned right now, it's, we are now doing a fresh budget. And that affects our big pool of funds we're talking about. So there's a lot of inconsistency that has been created. The second, we do not understand how to um, aggregate our education. There is a huge gap between our ability to maintain the university education or higher institution, whether they're in the colleges of education, the formal system. I have led a team, as, as a team lead, to talk about the artisan skills in this country. We have not taken time as a people to work on majorly building that pool of people, because right, they're not even in school. You can't have the capacity to give them white collar jobs and blue collar jobs, and you are not making it comfortable for them to take on their artisan skills or uh, at that level to become uh, more productive. Uh, let me say this, we are in this country, and I, I bet to be uh, challenged by anyone that some of the artisans in, from, from issues of uh, piping to issues of POP and tiling, you will soon discover that we import people from Togo and Benin Republic to do that. And we have a huge population, not only energetic and interested in working on that, but we have not considered that. There's a lot of inconsistency in our policies. Things that are working, we jettison them. We, and you don't get that result. Japan became the second largest economy. They are the third largest economy in the world by shutting down their borders for three decades and working on their own system consistent Talk about Singapore and celebrate Singapore is an element of consistency policies that consist these are people who would have would be speeding everywhere in fact it's a tradition for them to sit down and speak but a superior superior culture came and, and taught them that they needed to do something differently we all rush there. Um, you will be shocked to go and find out that the products from your own country, the people buy from Dubai and bring it back to your own country. What? It's consistency from 1994. Dubai was something you want to go and, and get involved. We know the history of how they even asked us um, whether we could help them. They became consistent what they were doing. The, the, the people in government must realize it's about the people. It's about Nigerians. Unfortunately, again, the Nigerian society does not insist on some of this. And so we lose out at the end of the day. We seem to have options. So we, we are quick to just run away from the responsibilities that come with uh, developing a country. We're not sacrificing anything. How on earth can you have a, 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 a document to 2019? And this is 2022 or two, and you have not done anything to ease up that and you hope that these people 
will become at, at the end of the day. How are our education systems rated? They are rated from the inability of our consistency. Yeah. Oh, oh, we build on. We build on. All right. Victor, in all of this, there's no how we talk about voter education uh, towards the general election. I won't talk about the electoral body, which is INEC. Uh, which brings me to the last yes. of my, uh, the, 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 the two W's and the H now, is how do people vote correctly? Uh, we had the last election, I'm sure I talked about a particular party that's uh, relatively unknown, that came third, and we heard that many people voted wrongly because they did not know, uh, you know which party they, they were voting for, something like that. And that should not, that is not meant to run down the party. I think they have the followership as well. However, um, INEC and the role as the chief, uh, you know, operator of teaching people the best way to vote, followed by the political parties, but then just as you said, civil society organizations and people like you and I, how do we start to start early towards 2023? The, the political part, I'm still coming back because the, the highest investors of this journey are actually the political parties. And so they should invest. I understand the budget that the INEC I always access from government. And we all know that at some point, whether it, it gets to go, able to deliver the results they want or not. One thing is very clear, the political parties are the greatest beneficiaries of this journey and they should deliberately invest in it. I was hoping that for every, for instance, PDP is asking for 20 million for, for um, gubernatorial candidates. I, I've not heard anyone say 10% uh, of that, 20% or 35% of the education to their own members. People, yes, have not been taught. Uh, the, and and my, my, another challenge is that we're even moving to the electronic system. And so it's important that we take our time and really invest in our uh, um, voter education in terms of identifying the, the um, parties that need to be voted into. And then there's this also idea of uh, too many parties. Sometimes when you look at over 70 something parties at some point, I think INEC can help us in this regard. That while we're talking to political parties to make sure that they invest so much, some good chunk of their money in voter education, INEC must go around and do their own analysis and assessment carefully to let us know truly how many political parties are viable, how many political parties should be on our ballot. This it, it has nothing to do with whoever is. If there are those that need to merge or those that need to fall out of, let's know, and it, so that we have some good space that we can think and have some breather in there. Because if have that we're not likely to get anywhere then the the activists the, the social activists the the um, different groups that we all have it's, it's sad that we are we, we seem to be working 60 to 75 percent in the towns very few go back to those right. local governments and teach people how it, to go about the voting system it's a so rolling it's important that we do absolutely the, yes yes victor it's a, it's a rolling conversation we're going to keep our hands and fingers on this one and uh, see where it takes us to, but we're out of time. But thank you very much, Victor okay. Kuchili, author, oh, development okay. consultant. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. We're going to touch base with you definitely. One of the more important voices we need to hear in the countdown to the 2023 general election. We'll go to a quick break. we come back. And we're still going That's to stay. Good. Thank you, Victor. Thank you. When we come back, we'll still stay with the politics. Please stay with us on News Hub.